in Black, a novel by Steve Perry, based on the screen story and screen play by Ed Solomon. It was past midnight, and a state road was as quiet as the inside of a coffin. The South Texas summer skies were filled with stars, though, pinpoints of light against the black curtain of a moonless night. The South Texas skies were also filled with a couple million insects, moths, mosquitoes, lightning bugs, june bugs, flying weevils, stray roaches, no and God knew what else. The bodies of a whole truckload of the suckers formed a gooey green and yellow paste on the windshield of the black 86 Ford LTD, where it sat parked next to a clump of something that might, if it was lucky, grow up to be a tumbleweed someday. The car was on a tiny hillock a couple of hundred yards off the road, but the ground was hard and dry, only a little sand sprinkled over it, easy enough for even a stock Ford to navigate on it. Not that the LTD was exactly stuck. A mosquito buzzed from the hot night in through the Ford's open passenger window. Riding shotgun D swatted at the mosquito. Damn bugs. K, the car's other occupant, sat behind the wheel, staring into the darkness. He said, I hear that, partner. Both men wore white shirts, black ties, and black suits. Their black shoes were so shiny, they could have been patent leather. D shook his head. He was the older of the two men, close to retirement age, and had a good 15 years on K. There's no way for a grown man to make a living, D said. He swatted at the mosquito again, smashed it against the side of his neck. K looked at a pack of camels on the dash with longing. Be easier to do the job with a smoke, but nope. Couldn't risk the light being seen, maybe even smelled. Out here in the boonies, odors traveled a long way. Too bad. Shit. You and John Wayne. You wound me, D. K. put a hand over his heart as if shot. D. shook his head again. You keep smoking them cigarettes, you're gonna wind up like the Duke did, too. He paused. I'm getting too old for this, Hoss. They'd been partners a long time. They knew how each other thought. Ah, oh, you're not old. You're just like a fine vintage wine, getting better with age. Turned into vinegar, you mean. D, D, why do you want to talk like that? Oops, hello. K reached for the ignition key. Looky here. It's showtime, folks. In the flat distance, the lights of a lone vehicle gleamed on the state road. The Ford's engine caught with a rumble that was a lot more muscular than it ought to be for standard Detroit iron. As they watched, several sets of auto headlights flared on the road to their left. The vehicles, a couple of four-wheel drives and late model Chevrolets, were lined up blocking the road. They were close enough for Kay to read the INS logos on them. La Migra, they called them down here. The border patrol was awake and about to stem the tide of wetbacks. He grinned. Bush League guys. They didn't have a clue. Still... Kay felt a certain kinship with them, such that it was. The approaching vehicle slowed, came to a halt at the roadblock. Kay saw that it was a white van, couple years old, covered with dust that had surely spent the morning in Mexico. Welcome to Estados Unidos, amigos. Everybody out of the car and nobody moves real quick. Kay put the Ford in gear and the car headed toward the road. Hang on, Kay said. He trumped the brake, cut the wheel, and put the LTD into a slide. Kicked up a lot of dust as the Ford skidded sideways and came to a stop behind the white van. Both cars lit by the headlights of the Border Patrol's vehicles. There were half a dozen INS boys, well, figuratively speaking, since one of them was a woman, spread out around the van. The Ford's arrival spooked them some, since about half of them pulled their pieces. Spooked, too, the dozen allegedly illegal Mexican immigrants standing behind the van where they were waiting for La Migra to finish busting their coyote before they all got sent back home. Life was hard and expensive, too. D and K got out of the Ford. Evening, gentlemen, K said. He held up his badge case with its ID so nobody would get trigger happy. We'll take it from here. 
A tall, good-looking kid of about 30 marched over to where Kay stood, shined his black aluminum six-cell light at Kay's ID, squinted at it. I'm Agent Janice, the kid said. This is my operation. Who the hell are... He finally made out the ID. You're INS? Division 6, Kay said. He pocketed the badge case. I never heard of Division 6. Really? You need to pay more attention to memos from HQ, son. We selectively monitor field operations. Nobody told me. I'm glad to hear that, because if they had, they'd be in a lot of trouble. These little inspections are supposed to be a surprise. Now you stand back and let us have a few words with these folks. It was all in your attitude, Kay knew. Act like you were in charge, and nine times out of ten, whoever was on the scene would let you take over without a fight. The tenth time? Well, there were ways around that, if you were who Kay was. The Mexicans stood in a line nervously, a group ranging in age from a babe in arms to a couple of grannies. What do you think, D? D walked along the line, looking carefully at the illegals. Tough call. Guess we're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. K nodded. He moved to the first man in line. K pasa, amigo? Como se llama? Miguel, the man said. K smiled, moved on. To one of the grannies, he said, No se preocupe, abuela. Bien vanita a los Estados Unidos. Gracias, senor, she said. He went down the line, smiling and nodding at the group. When he got to the fifth man, who smiled like an idiot, K turned and glanced at D, who nodded. Definitely possible. To the man, K said, still in Spanish, Hey, friend, what's that break your face? The man's smile stayed pasted on, and he nodded. Some of the other illegals frowned at their comrade. From his appearance, the man should certainly be able to understand what La Migra had just said, and it was apparent he did not. Ah, folks, I do believe we have a winner, Kay said, glancing at D yet again. In Spanish, he said, The rest of you are free to go. Back into the van and scram. Janice, not unexpectedly, took exception. What? You can't do that. Son, I can do just about anything I want here. This is a special Division Six operation. If you give me any flack, you're going to be riding a sway-back donkey down the Rio Grande for the next five years. Janice paled, visible even in the dim light. All in the attitude. Act like you have the power. People believe you. The van's driver jumped into the van, yelled at his passengers who piled in the back. The van pulled around the roadblock and sped north. This is highly irregular, Janice tried. Agent Janice, is it? We do this kind of thing all the time. Now you run along, let us deal with Paco here, and keep this to yourselves. We like to maintain a low profile in Division 6. Reluctantly, Janice and the other agents headed for their vehicles. Once they were gone, D and K looked at their captive. This way, amigo, K said. We need to have few words with you. From beneath his coat, D pulled what looked like a Desert Eagle 44 Magnum and waved it at the captive. A major handgun, even the stock ones, and this one didn't look quite like the basic out-of-the-box model. It had a few modifications, quite unusual modifications at that. The illegal immigrant moved off the road with the two men. Kay put an arm around the man's shoulders. I think maybe you jumped off the bus in the wrong part of town, amigo. In fact, I'd bet dollars against pesos you're not from anywhere remotely near here. With that, Kay pulled the electronic stripper from his belt and triggered it, ran it down the front of the immigrant's clothes. The laser light flashed, and there came a sound much like somebody undoing a heavy zipper. The immigrant's clothes peeled away from his body. Then his flesh peeled away from his body. What remained was a five-and-a-half-foot-tall creature covered with scales, snail-like tentacles, and eyes mounted on stalks. The only bit of camouflage remaining was the immigrant's head, mounted on a stick held in the creature's tentacles. The fake head continued to smile and nod as the alien operated the controls on the other end of the rod. Kay shook his head. Mikey, when did they let you out of jail? The alien made a reply. It sounded like a combination of a lizard eating a moth and a jar full of angry wasps. Kay smiled. Political refugee. Uh-huh, right. Do I look like I was born yesterday, Mikey? D said, 
You know how many treaty articles you've just violated? Mikey gave out a lame squeak. D said, well, let's see. Unauthorized immigration, failure to document inoculations, non-payment of landing fee, failure to obtain a proper visa. Oh, Mikey, Mikey, the list goes on and on. You're in a lot of trouble, boy. K said, yep, and whoever dropped you in old Mexico is going to owe you a refund. At the very least, you should have gotten a language implant or one of them contraband universal translators. Can't trust anybody these days, can you, Mikey? Mikey sputtered more noise. Now, 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 you know better than that. Don't insult us here, Mikey. That won't do you any good. You don't really want to add bribery to the charges, do you? K said. Mikey, shut up. Hand me the head and put out your tentacles. You know the drill, K ordered. God, God, somebody said from behind them. K and D turned, as did Mikey. In the starlight, Agent Jana stood there gaping at them. Well, shit, Kay said. Mikey dropped the anima electronic puppet head and snarled, showing an impressive array of large shark-like teeth. The stench of his breath was like meat that had rotted a few days in the hot Texas sunshine. Agent Janice screamed as the alien slammed into D, knocked him sprawling, then took off straight for Janice. The INS agent tried to pull his gun, fumbled the weapon, then dropped it. Mikey bounded toward the men, emitted a scream that started high and scaled right into the ultrasonic. Janice stood there like a rabbit caught in a truck's headlights, paralyzed with fear. Mikey, stop, Kay yelled. That didn't help. The little bastard kept on charging. What the hell had gotten into him? Mikey wasn't violent. At least he hadn't ever been before. Who did he think Janice was? D rolled to his hands and knees, cursed, picked up the gun he dropped cursed, adjusted a control on the side, cursed again. K went for his own weapon, but he didn't know if he could clear leather in time to make the shot. Mikey had up a good head of steam by now. D, shoot, he yelled, but D was still fiddling with his gun's controls. K jerked his gun from the hip holster under his jacket, but it came out with glacial slowness. Time stalled. Mikey sprinted the last few yards, gathered himself for the leap, and sprang. K lined up and fired. Mikey's torso exploded into hot blue goo as a sizzling white flash speared him. Bits of tissue and circulating fluid sprayed like a burst water balloon, painting the landscape and the terrified INS agent alike with dead Mikey. The alien fell, tumbled, sprawled next to Janice, dead before he slid to a stop. K blew out a big sigh. Damn. That was close. He kept his weapon out. He did a fast 360 out of habit, looking for more targets. No more like Mikey. But he saw the rest of the INS boys hopping out of their cars, her doors slamming and yelling as they ran toward the flash and noise. Now there was really a stink to complain about. Pew-wee. Well, shit, Kay said. He put his gun away. At least Mikey wasn't going to be sneaking on planet anymore. D came to his feet shook his head, holstered his own weapon. Janice tried to speak. D -d 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 that, Kay offered. W -w wasn't, wasn't human, Kay finished. I know. Here, you got some entrail on you. Kay reached over with his handkerchief and brushed away some of the goo that had recently been Mikey. The other INS agents boiled in, bristling with guns and questions. Kay sighed. Well, they'd stepped in it now. And where the hell was the cleanup crew? He looked around, as if in response to the thought a pair of headlights approached on the road. A uniformed agent pointed his somewhat shaky pistol at Kay. You better do some fast talking, mister. There's no such thing as an INS Division 6. If I may, Kay put his hand into his inside coat pocket and pulled the neuralizer out, also very slowly. It didn't look threatening. It looked like a pocket recorder with a red diode on it. The kid with the gun said, What the hell is that? It's a neuralizer, a gift from some out-of-town friends. The little red eye here isolates and measures bioelectric impulses in your brain. Actually, to be more specific, it works on the ones connected to your memory. Once those are stored, then things are a snap. What the hell are you talking about, the kid said. 
The car approaching pulled to a halt. Some of the INS team turned to face it, guns drawn. The cleanup crew, six men dressed in identical black suits, white shirts, black ties, and mirror bright black shoes, alighted from the car. Another 86 LTD, also black. The six already had their sunglasses on. Kay called out to the men in black. We're going to need a splay burn on the perimeter, gentlemen. Holes at 40, 60, and 80, if you would be so kind as we play the old underground gas pocket routine yet again. Janice found his voice. If you don't explain what is going on here right now, I'm hauling all your asses in. Take it easy. I'm about to. Who are you? Well, son, I'm afraid I'm just a figment of your imagination. And that, not for long. Kay pulled his sunglasses from his handkerchief breast pocket, saw D do the same. The two men put the glasses on. Everybody, look here, Kay said, and he waved the neuralizer. All the agents looked. All in all, humans were a pretty gullible species. Kay triggered the device. There came a brilliant strobe-like flash. Kay looked at his watch. Like I said, better hurry, gentlemen. Quickly, the six men in black went back to their Ford's trunk and pulled out flamethrowers. They fired several blasts at burning blobs of fuel in a circular pattern around K.D. and the Border Patrol guys and gal. The INS agents didn't move. The men in black hurriedly put the flamethrowers away, pulled fire extinguishers from the car's trunk, and stood ready. Right about now. Janice said, uh, huh? What the hell? Seems to be the question of the night, doesn't it? Lucky to be alive after a blast like that, aren't we, fellas? The other INS agents came out of their trances, looked around, puzzled. The men in black sprayed extinguisher foam on the burning spots. Is that a freak accident or what, said Kay? Who'd ever figure there was a pocket of underground gas out here? After the INS boys and girl had departed, new memories in place, and the cleanup crew had also booked, Kay walked back to the LTD. D sat on the hood. Kay leaned against the car's door. How you doing, D? I'm sorry about back there, D said. Mikey should never have gotten a jump on me like that. Hey, it happens. You didn't used to. He held up his hands. They trembled. I'm past it, Kay. Kay could feel his partner's pain. D looked up. Beautiful, aren't they? The stars. For a long moment, neither man said anything. I tell you, Kay, I know it's time to go. But I am going to miss the chase. He waved at the smoldering spots in the desert. Kay put on his sunglasses. No, he said quietly. You're not going to miss it at all, D. The silver shield on its chain around his neck thumped against James Edwards' chest as he ran through the New York City night, whacking him pretty good, given as how it was just a badge and not all that heavy. Probably be a little bit heavier if it was gold, but there wasn't much chance of that happening anytime soon. It was kind of hard to get to be a detective when you had an attitude like James. Even he had to admit that. Still, the silver one was whacking him hard enough. Of course, he was running full speed. The fleeing perp held his lead over Edwards. The man was 25 yards ahead and going strong. Christ, the perp must be on speed or something. Well, he'd been chasing a guy for six blocks in the damn dark, and this was getting old. The perp ducked into the subway, right into Grand Central Terminal. Fine. Time to try something else. Stop! NYPD! He yelled. Sometimes that helped. It helped, all right. The perp fired his afterburners and put on a burst of speed. Stop! Police! He tried again. The perp just sped up more. Damn, Edwards thought. The perp was heading up and back to the streets again. Taking the stairs two at a time, Edwards continued his pursuit. The perp made it to Park Avenue Bridge. He looked back at Edwards, then vaulted over the rail to 41st Street below. Damn, that was a 30-foot drop. Easy. Guy had to be tanked on something. Edwards took as deep a breath as he could get and bailed over the side. Perp could do it, he could do it. Oof! He came down on one of those cheesy, fake, double-decker buses. This one was full of tourists, enough cameras among them to sink the Staten Island Ferry. They gaped at him, open-mouthed. 
Don't worry, folks, just part of the tour. Perp, where was the perp? There he was, already off the bus and on his feet again. Damn. One of those slow-moving New York Post delivery trucks came by, going in the right direction. Edward sprinted, caught the back of the truck, climbed aboard. There the perp was, running along the curb, still going strong, too. The truck caught up with the perp. Edwards leaned out and smiled. Ain't a line, pal. Your luck just ran out. He jumped from the truck and brought the perp down with a fairly nice tackle, if he did say so himself. The perp yelled, he's coming, he's coming. Edwards shook his head. Yeah, right, he gets here, I'm gonna bust his ass too. Give me your hands. He pulled his cuffs. The perp turned his face toward the policeman. He looked terrified. Then he blinked, and Edwards pulled his face back and stared at the perp. Holy shit. The guy had two sets of eyelids. The outside ones were normal, but the inside ones were white and kind of gummy looking. Something was definitely wrong with this picture. He's coming, he's coming, the perp babbled again. Who are you talking about? Abruptly, the perp moved. He had something in his hand, gun. It was a weird looking piece, like it belonged on Deep Space Nine or somewhere. The perp pointed it at Edwards. The gun's bottom half glowed a kind of pulsing yellow and it whined like a dog whistle. NYPD undercover officer James Edwards focused his entire attention on that weird gun the perp pointed at him. He grabbed the perp's hand and slammed it down against the street. The perp's gun went poof and shattered into a million pieces. Zap! Just like that. The perp slammed his knee into Edwards' groin. Edwards grunted in pain, released his grip on the man, grabbed at his injury. The perp took off like his tail was on fire. Edwards put the pain into a holding area and started after the perp again. This guy was sure going to a lot of effort to avoid a bus that would probably get bargained down to a misdemeanor. Didn't make any sense. Most of what criminals did didn't make any sense. God damn it, you stop! Then the perp leaped over a moving car and ran toward the Guggenheim. Edwards stared. Nobody in the world could make that kind of jump. A bus rolled in front of him and Edwards pulled up short. When the bus passed, there was no sign of the perp. Well, damn. Edwards got to the Guggenheim and leaned over the wall that surrounded it, looking for his quarry. Something flew past him, the perp, who leaped from 20 feet down to the top of the Guggenheim. Man! He ran into the museum, up the grand ramp. When the perp opened the roof door to go into the Guggenheim, he got a surprise. Hi there, Spider-Man, Edwards said, his pistol aimed at the perp's nose. The perp moaned and started to back away, his hands held out in front of him. Hold up there, pal. But the perp kept backpedaling until he reached the roof's edge again. No, he's coming. He'll kill me. I failed, and he'll kill me. Edwards didn't know who he was, but it had dawned on him. It probably wasn't Jesus. Just take it easy, pal. Nobody's going to kill you. The perp tried to back up some more, but he was out of room. He hit the short safety wall, looked down, then back at Edwards, and went right over. He screamed all the way down. Edwards looked over the side. He wasn't walking away from this fall. Damn, man. What were you, Edwards thought. James Edwards sat on one of the Seen Better Days plastic chairs in Interrogation 1. Across from the young cop was the inspector from IAD, the shoe fly, as regular cops like to call them. The inspector said, two sets of eyelids. Edwards glared at the fat sergeant, one of the two uniforms who'd been behind him when he'd started chasing the perp, whatever the hell he was. The inspector from Internal Affairs considered his next words carefully. Was there anything else strange about the deceased suspect? Other than he must have been training for the Olympics? This guy was the fastest thing on two feet I've ever seen. Officer Edwards, did these uh, eyelids come out before or after the perpetrator drew the weapon that vanished in a puff of smoke when you hit it? Snide sucker, this guy. He didn't need to be sarcastic. Before. Inspector Shoefly glanced over at the fat sergeant and Phillips, the other uniform, said, And why is it do you think that these two officers did not see these eyelids and goofy handgun? The other uniform spoke up. Uh, look, look, Inspector, I was too busy staring at those little antennae coming out of the top of his head. I think he was sending signals to Mars to start the invasion. That's what I think. The sergeant laughed. 
The inspector frowned. I think we're about done here. He shook his head. Sergeant, I'd like to speak with you and Officer Phillips outside, please. He got up, nodded at Edwards, headed for the hallway that led to the squad room. After they were gone, Edwards slumped in his chair. Man, this was crazy. Guy with two sets of eyelids, able to climb walls like a human fly. Maybe this was all a bad dream. He closed his eyes, feeling exhausted. Stuff like this wasn't supposed to happen, even in New York City. Man, he was tired. Maybe just rest his head for a minute. Almost before he knew it, Edwards felt himself drop off into sleep. He awoke when somebody touched him on the shoulder. He jerked, spun away from the touch. A pretty woman in a lab coat stood there staring at him. What, he died and this was his reward? Well, not bad, not bad. Officer Edwards? Yeah, I'm Laurel Weaver, deputy medical examiner. You sent us over a corpse this afternoon. Can you tell me something about it? I mean, its background? It? She looked around, leaned closer to him. She looked tired, too. Yeah, well, I did a quick prelim, opened it up. And let me tell you, I've never seen anything. She chopped off her words as the door to the interrogation room swung open and Herr Ullman, the Polish detective, peered in. Somebody here to see you, James. Edwards shook his head. Now what? Herr Ullman moved off. The doctor said, listen, I don't want to talk about this here. I have to go. Check by the morgue later, okay? I really think we should discuss this further. There was a sense of urgency in her speech. Uh, yeah, right. Well, why not? She was a lot better looking than his landlady, who was the only other woman he had any kind of relationship with at the moment. I'll call you, set up an appointment or something, he said. Please, and make it quickly. I have a strange feeling about this. She left, and he stared at her. Somebody stopped her just outside the door in the hallway. He couldn't see who, but he heard a man's voice say, Ah, Dr. Weaver, you're working on that John Doe jumper, is that right? The speaker had more than a little cracker in him, to judge from his voice. Yes, I'm Dr. Weaver. Why? Look here, doctor. What is that? There came a bright flash of light. What the hell? Edward started for the door. A man in a black suit and white shirt stepped in front of the door, blocking it. Evening. You'd be Officer James Edwards, is that right? I am. Who are you? The man in black walked to the video cam inside its steel cage in the corner, pointed what looked like a pen light at it, and pushed a button. There was a little hum, and the video cam's red light went out. Have a seat, son. I'm not your son, and I'm done sitting for the time being. Who are you? Call me Kay, the man said. Want to tell me what happened out there? How about I tell you a joke instead? You're going to laugh either way. Well, let me see. The guy who fell off the roof had two sets of eyelids, the inner set of which were kind of gummy looking. How'd you know that? Edwards felt better. He wasn't crazy. No, he had stumbled into something, something big enough to bring in the feds. Now the trick was how to find out what it was and who this guy was. What are you, FBI? You ran him down and then kicked his ass. That's pretty amazing, son. You don't know how amazing. I have to tell you, I am impressed, and I don't impress all that easily. CIA? You know about this thing, don't you? I know about a lot of things. Did he say anything before he fell? Some kind of nonsense, something like, he's coming, I failed, he's going to kill me. This weapon he had, you think you'd recognize it if you saw it again? Yeah, I'd recognize it. The man in black stood smiled, but it didn't touch his eyes. Come on, let's take a little ride. I've cleared it with your lieutenant. You're being detached to help us in this matter. National Security Agency. The man in black just grinned wider. Inside the LTD, the young cop looked around. Come on, man, so who are you? Lay it out, Mr. Man in Black. Kay said, I work for an agency that monitors and polices alien activities here on Earth. That right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Me too, in fact. He stopped as Kay pulled the LTD to the curb. He looked around. This is not the best neighborhood, you know, to be stopping in. That's Jack Jeeb's pawn shop. Guy buys from two-bit chain grabbers and purse snatchers. I know. Let's go in, shall we? 
No skin off my ass. But I have to tell you, even a piece of junk like this four is going to be half gone time we get back. They got boys that can strip it to frame while you go in to take a leak. I'll take my chances. Edward shrugged. Your car. Don't say I didn't warn you. Kay smiled again. He liked this kid. He was sassy, brash. Reminded him of himself 20 years or so ago. He walked around to the trunk, popped it. You go ahead on in. Let Jeeves know we want to have a few words with him, would you? Kay watched the kid swagger into the pawn shop, shook his head. Ah, the arrogance of youth. He closed the trunk, pulled the trigger device from his coat pocket, pointed it at the LTD, and pressed the arm button. He was almost to the door of the pawn shop before the first booster got to the Ford and tried to slim jim the lock. There was a loud pop. And when Kay looked back, all that remained of the would-be car thief was a smoking dark spot on the sidewalk. He grinned. All in a day's work. Jack Jeeves was a baggy-faced man who looked to be in his mid-forties. As Edwards entered the pawn shop, Jeeves was throwing stuff into boxes, moving like a man in a big hurry. Going someplace, Jeeves? The pawn shop owner paused for a moment, looked up. I, uh, Officer Edwards, uh, yeah, I, um, I'm relocating, uh, if it's any of your business. Edwards drifted toward Jeeves. Well, the fact is, Jeeves, I'm looking for something. You know what I'm talking about here? I'm talking about something on the lines of hardware, lethal hardware. Jeeves paled. He swallowed, shook his head. I don't know what you mean, officer. Edwards grinned. I look stupid to you, Jeeves. You're hiding something. Jeeves' eyes went wide as he stared past Edwards. Man looked like he'd just seen Dracula stroll into the joint. Edwards glanced over his shoulder. Kay had just stepped into the place. Jeeves said, Ah, uh, hi, Kay. Edwards frowned, glanced back at Jeeves, then at Kay again. You know this scumbag? We're acquainted, yes, Kay said. Okay, Jeeves, where are the imports? Imports? Well, I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about, Kay. Kay pulled his pistol and pointed it at Jeeves. You know what I'd do to liars, Jeeves? Edwards fought to keep his grin in check. He knew this routine. Kay was a bad cop, and he knew his part. Hey, take it easy, Kay. Jeeves is trying to help us here. Ain't that right, Jeeves? Jeeves swallowed. I don't have anything. I don't know anything. Kay squeezed the trigger. The kaboom bounced off the walls. Jeeves' head exploded. Blood and brains flew everywhere. Holy shit! Edwards somehow managed to pull his own weapon. He pointed it at Kay, who'd already lowered his piece to point at the floor. Put it down. Put it down right now. Scumbag or not, you couldn't just execute somebody like that. I warned him. Put the gun down. You warned him too. Read my lips, asshole. You are under arrest. Lighten up, Edwards. What are you going to arrest me for? Discharging a firearm in the city limits? You're crazy. You... Edwards abruptly shut up because the sudden short circuit in his brain stopped his mouth from working. His lips moved, but no sound came out. He was looking right at Jeeb's when the dead man got to his feet. Blap! Just like that, blown open head and all. He felt his mouth gape, but he was unable to control it. Jeeb's head flowed, morphed, and reformed into a new head. The new head looked at Kay. I wish you wouldn't do that. Kay stepped forward, grabbed Jeeb's, and shoved his pistol under the rebuilt chin. I don't have time to screw around here, Jeeves. Show me the toys, or I'll use up another head, at the least. All right, all right, Jeeves said. In the back. Jeeves started toward the counter, Kay following him. Kay turned to look at Edwards. You just gonna stand there and catch flies in your mouth? Edwards shook his head. No way he was gonna try arresting anybody and try to explain this one. He followed the two. In the back, Jeeves went to a shelf. He touched a hidden control, and the shelf rotated, revealing more boxes on the other side. Jeeves pointed at a box. There's the hardware. Come take a look, Kay said to Edwards. Edwards walked over, looked in. There were a bunch of things in the box. They looked like a display from a sci-fi convention. 
There it is, Edward said. That one looks just like the one the guy I chased had. Kay shook his head. Jeebs. Jeebs. You sold a reverberating carbonizer with implosion capacity to an unlicensed illegal cephalopod? Jeebs shrugged. He said he left his license in his other body. He looked okay to me. Kay sighed. All right, Jeebs. It's confiscated. All of it. And I want you on the first transport out to the gravity well. Jeebs grinned nervously. They walked out of the shop. Kay came out with the box of sci-fi gear, took the stuff to the car, and put it in the trunk. After he shut the trunk, Kay walked back over to where Edwards sat and sat next to him. Having a little trouble putting a handle on it, aren't you, son? Want me to give you some answers? Please. Kay lit a cigarette, said, I could tell you, but you wouldn't remember it anyway. Be wasting both our time. Kay put on his shades, took what looked like a little tape recorder from his pocket. Here, ever see one of these, son? Edwards looked. What? There came a bright flash of light. If he got out of this alive, Curb thought, that Bulari used ship seller was going to pay through the sable too for sticking him with this piece of Garzian junk. The little twerp would be sorry his great-great-great-grandmother's egg had ever hatched. And then some. Well, yes, to be sure. Curb had been in a hurry and had not really pursued his inspection. That was his fault. And true, he hadn't a lot to spend on a ship he planned to use for just the one round trip before he junked it. But even so, they did not excuse the Bulari. He hadn't known that. He sighed. The sail had been criminal. The ship's warp engines were crap, the repellers were shot, and the isonic dampers were disharmonic to the third damn power. All of which meant he was going to thump down on this dung ball of a planet way, way too fast. And if the stasis cocoon couch didn't work any better than the rest of the zerk sucker of a ship, he was going to be splattered all over the countryside. And so much for his grand cosmic plan. Damn! The computer, whose sense of humor had apparently been corrupted, informed him that landing was imminent. Planet fall in 15 seconds, it said. Structural integrity of the outer hull is insufficient to withstand impact velocity. <laughs> Damage estimate to vessel, approximately 78% plus or minus 1%. <laughs> the computer laughed until the final few seconds until the ship smashed into the ground hard enough to bury half its diameter. Curb didn't see this, of course, because the stasis couch cocoon deployed, and it was his good fortune that it was the one piece of equipment that worked as designed. On impact, the couch formed a gelatinous shell around him that absorbed most of his inertia, not incidentally making him blind, deaf, and otherwise insensate in the process. When the couch released him, it was obvious the idiot computer had been right about the hull's integrity. Night air wafted through great rents in the vessel, an atmosphere that was, to him, too cold and too filled with alien stinks. Something jabbered at him in an alien tongue. Curb found his interneural universal translator button where it had fallen onto the couch and inserted it into his aural canal. The device picked up the alien language and converted it into omniversal in mid-sentence. One false move and I'll blast your outer space ass to kingdom come. Curb shifted his position so he could see through one of the gaping holes in the ship's hull. Well, well, there it was, a human, or as they were known galactically, a Terry. They certainly were ugly, fleshy, stunted little bastards, pointing what was obviously a projectile weapon at the ship. They never learned these inferior species. Curb said, put the gun down, stupid. His Vox Box translator, linked to the UT unit in his oral canal, transformed his command to place the projectile weapon on the ground less than optimal brained one. Well, that was close enough. The Terry skittered away for an instant, then edged back into view. It leveled the weapon at the ship again. My name is Edgar Yaks, and that's Mike pickup truck your damn spaceship just landed on and squashed. You owe me for it, pal. And as for my gun, you could have that when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. There's a deal, Curb said to the Edgar. Curb extended one of his cella and grabbed the Edgar by the head. 
The Edgar went irk and fired his projectile weapon, but the blast was ill-aimed and did no harm, save possibly to bacterial passers-by in the air. Curb dragged the Edgar into the ruined ship, killed it by carefully crushing the crunchy skull with his pincher, then examined the corpse. It was so small. He would have to fold himself into end space to get it on, and even then it would be a struggle. And such flimsy integument. The skeleton was internal. What a stupid design. Always something on these dead-end planets. He sighed, well... If he wanted to move around as one of them, he had to look like one of them. No point in putting it off. Another of the Edgar's species, a female, stood in the entryway to the artificial cave nearby. What did they call them here? Houses? It said, Edgar, everything all right? You look kind of peaked. Might as well get used to the identity. From now on, Curb would think of himself as Edgar, at least so long as he wore the disguise. Being folded into end space was not only painful and irritating, it also made him hungry. He was starving when he ate the remains of the Edgar. Now, after such a hasty meal, he was thirsty. He needed a nice drink. This female was obviously the property of the Edgar, so best he treated it accordingly. The female said, What was that blowed up the truck? Sugar, Edgar said. Sh sugar? I've never seen sugar do that before. Silence, you twit. Get me sugar now. The female made a gesture with its shoulders and went to a nearby box made of what appeared to be some organic woody plant carved and plain into flat sheets, opened a door and removed a container. He could smell the sweetness in it. Put it in water. The female obeyed, poured a small measure into a see-through container. Edgar grabbed it from her, downed it in one swallow. Ah, oh, that hit the spot. I, I, Edgar, the skin on your neck, it's just kind of hanging there. Did you get burned out of the truck? Edgar observed his reflection in the window. The female was correct. The integument had slipped a bit. He grabbed the face of it, twisted it back into place, and tucked the excess down into the opening of the clothing covering the disguise. Better, he said. The female collapsed, apparently unconscious. Hmm, how odd. Some kind of local ritual? Well, to business. A few more helpings of the sugar and then back to the ship. He would have to move it, hide it somewhere, and repair it. Always something that went wrong. Never failed. He went back to the ship, dug under the rear, being careful not to tear his new integument, and lifted the ship out of the crater. He dropped it on the ground. Oof! Not so much heavy as awkward. He looked around. No other houses nearby. That was fortunate. There were empty fields and patches of tall, woody, stalked plants. Trees, the translator told him. Even some four-legged mammalian creatures here and there. But none of the human Terrans about. Good. He briefly considered returning to the structure and eating the female but decided against it. She looked stringy and tough, and he wasn't all that hungry anymore. James Edward stood across the street from the building whose address matched that on the card in his hand. It was a squat, square building. He probably had passed it a hundred times and never noticed it before. Big deal. He'd lived in New York all his adult life, and there were thousands of buildings he'd never noticed, unless a perp ran into one. Oh, well. He jaywalked across the street. Inside, the place had a weird look to it. One whole wall was dominated by huge blades of a tunnel vent air intake. Made no sense to put that in the lobby. Place wasn't big enough to need that much air. There was a single elevator at the far end of the room, and an old security guard sat perched on a folding metal chair halfway between the entrance and the elevator. Edwards walked toward the guard. The old geezer looked up. Help you? Uh, yeah, I got this card. Elevator, the guard cut in. Push the call button. Edward shook his head and walked to the elevator. Why would this guy, Kay, want to meet him here? Why would anybody want to come here at all? As he approached the elevator, the doors thwipped open. There was nobody inside. What the hell? He stepped inside. 
hit the call button. Nothing happened. He reached out to hit the button again. Ahem. Somebody cleared their throat behind him. Edward spun. The back wall of the elevator was gone, and there was another weird room in front of him. Half a dozen men sat in egg-shaped chairs, all of the guys looking at him. There was one empty chair. An old guy in a black suit, white shirt, and tie stood facing the chairs, dressed just like Kay had been. You're late, the old guy said. Have a seat. Edward shrugged, moved to the empty chair. The elevator door slid shut. The old guy nodded and said, My name is Zed. You're here because you're the best of the best. You number among the best Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, and New York's finest. Some of the other six men, all short-haired and straight-spined, cast glances at Edwards where he slouched in his chair. Military dudes, all of them. He knew the look. The old man said, We're looking for just one of you. What will follow is a series of simple tests to quantify your motor skills, hand-eye coordination, concentration, and stamina. Okay, let's move on. The other six guys stood as one, like they were machines. Edwards got to his feet more leisurely. Whatever these dudes were into, he didn't think he wanted to be part of it. But he might as well go along and see where it led, given that he'd come this far. End of side one. Papers balanced on their knees, trying to write on them. This was stupid. They couldn't come up with some desks. There was a small table against one wall. Nobody was using it. Hell with this. He got up, walked over to the table, and dragged it back in front of his little egg chair. The other testees glared at him as he moved the table. Hey. He wasn't going to be punching no holes in his good pants for some silly-ass IQ test. And he had to say it. it was pretty damn silly. If you hold a spoon under the stream of water running from the faucet into your kitchen sink, will the water spray farthest from it, A, bowl up, or B, bowl down? Jesus, what kind of question was that? They must not be looking for rocket scientists here. That was for damn sure. Zed herded the seven of them into another room. There was nothing in it but a counter, and on the counter, seven handguns. What? They were going to have to field strip the pieces? All of a sudden, the walls just kind of pulled apart, and all of a sudden, there was a shitload of stuff going on. Lights flashing, sirens screaming, and all kinds of things. Bug-eyed monsters, ugly critters, even a little girl, all right there. Gentlemen, protect yourselves, an amplified voice yelled. Hogan's Alley, Edwards realized, a shooting gallery. The seven of them all went for the pieces. This was obviously a hand-eye motor skill, can you shoot worth a crap test. Edwards snatched up one of the pistols, checked out the horde of creatures. Six shots went off pretty much all together. Damn, these guys were fast. He picked his target and fired, nearly a second behind the other six. He pulled the trigger again for a double tap to make sure, but the gun clicked empty. Only one round. Interesting. The targets froze. The lights dimmed. The sirens stopped. The six guys all looked at each other, then at Edwards. You could almost hear what they were thinking. Too slow, pal. Your history. Gentlemen, table your weapons, please. Zed stepped into the room. He walked straight to Edwards. The other six tried to hold their smiles in check. Took your time, didn't you? I need to be sure my target, sir. Zed turned and looked at the targets. The most obvious in the frozen holographic crowd, and Edwards was pretty sure that's what it was, a hologram, was the big snarling beast that looked kind of like the Tasmanian devil. It had three holes in its chest. Next to Taz was a really ugly sucker who looked like some pissed-off god had given it a fish hook for a head. It also had three holes at the center of mass. At the back of the horde was an eight-year-old girl, she had a single bullet hole right between her eyes. Zed looked back at Edwards. Mind if I ask you why you felt little Tiffany back there deserved to die? She was the only one who seemed dangerous. She doesn't really look like a little girl should. The face is crooked. The stance is weird. Why is she in this crowd? Nobody's holding her hostage, and anybody looking for a threat would probably consider her the last target they'd shoot at. That's it? Edwards shrugged. There's the books. 
way too advanced for somebody her age. Look at the titles. You can see that? Zed looked at the other six men and shook his head. Kay stood in the hall watching the would-be recruits through the smoked glass, smiling. He hefted the thick manila folder he held as Zed came in, shaking his head. Your boy has a real problem with authority. He got the right target, Kay offered. He's going to be a lot more trouble than he's worth. Hell, Zed, the kid ran down a cephalopod on foot, then walked away from a hand-to-hand -hand with it. How many people we got can do that? You've made up your mind already, haven't you? Kay watched as Zed rounded the corner and went back into the shooting gallery. The older man led the recruits back to the main interview room. Kay followed them, saw Edward see him. Hey, hey, it's Mr. Kay. How you doing? Kay smiled. The kid did have a certain charm. Reminded him of himself 30 years ago. Hold up there, sport, Kay said. Edwards hung back a little. Zed took the other six men ahead. As they walked, Kay said, Back at about 1954 or 55, the government started a little underfunded agency with the simple purpose of making contact with a race not of this planet. It seemed pretty funny at the time, so the government didn't exactly spread the word. The money got bled off some slush funds, and only a handful of people even knew the agency existed. He tapped the folder with his free hand. Ahead of them, Zed led the six troopers into a small alcove. One final test, gentlemen. If you look right here, he held up a neuralizer. Edward started to turn around. Don't bother, son. They have other things on their mind right now. He handed Edwards the folder. Check out the pictures. The first one was back when Kay was a trainee, early 60s. God, had he ever been that young. Nice, Edward said. Thing is, the aliens made contact upstate New York back in the early 60s. Edwards shuffled to the next picture. Two ships hovering in the night sky. Classic flying saucer stuff. There were seven men in black then. That's what MIB stands for. Plus an amateur astronomer who spotted the ship. And one stupid kid who got lost on a back road on his way to pick up his date and happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We all got to the ships right after they landed. The next picture showed the ship. The hatch open, unmistakable alien shapes inside. At the portal, a very young-looking K stood holding a bouquet of flowers. Oh, go on. You brought flowers to little green men? They moved in the B corridor, impossibly long for the building in which they were in. K noticed, as always, the odor of spice as he entered the corridor. K said, The first ones were intergalactic refugees, and they were looking for someplace apolitical a neutral place where a few of them at a time could hang out. The next picture was a killer. Hey, that's the World's Fair, out in Queens, right? Still under construction. We studied about it in state history. Up on those towers, are those, uh, yes, the flying saucers from that first meeting. You mean the World's Fair was a cover-up for alien contact? Why else would anybody have a World's Fair in Queens? Edwards paused for a second, then said, So, you're saying... Right. We have a small, non-human population now, living among us in secret. Oh, do tell. Don't take offense, Mr. K. But I think maybe it's time for me to be heading on back to precinct. The Sarge will be worried about me, you know? K shrugged as they came abreast of the kitchen. That's what you want. Let me grab a cup of coffee here, and I'll show you the way out. He opened the door and held it for Edwards. The kid took two steps and stopped as if he'd turned to stone. Kay had to smile. Three Vermars, tall and reedy aliens who looked a lot like man-sized centipedes balanced on their tails, stood next to a water cooler shooting the breeze. They spoke Vermarian, and they smelled like fresh doughnuts. Iggy, the senior of the triad, waved a pseudopod at Kay as he went to get coffee. Ah, they floating, Iggy. Damn, don't tell me we're out of cream again. Iggy chittered, pointed at the counter. Oh, yeah, thanks, I didn't see it. He found the cream behind a box of stale doughnuts. Thanks, Iggy. Kay looked at Edwards. Okay, kid, you ready to roll? Edwards stood there with his mouth open, staring. Kay nodded at the Vermars. 
See you around, guys. They gave him some feedback squeals and waved. Kay walked to where Edward stood, put one finger under his chin, and pushed his mouth closed. Edwards looked at him. Come on, kid. Let's go take a walk. I'll fill you in on what you need to know. The young cop wasn't doing so bad, all things considered. No worse than he had done, certainly. This way. We want to stay on the green line this trip, he pointed at the floor. Edwards followed him, but kept looking back behind him. James Edwards sat on the bench in Battery Park next to Kay, still the only name he'd been given, first or last. He kept trying to get his mind around it, but it just didn't want to stretch. Aliens! Son of a bitchin' aliens! Kay said, At any given time, we've got around 1,500 aliens on planet, most of them right here in the city, but quite a few others spread around the whole world, and nearly all of them are decent folks trying to make a living and to blend in. Kay nodded at the people in the park. They don't know. See, it would wreck their world view to know. Most people can't deal with the naked truth. People are smart. They could handle it. Wrong. A person can be smart. But people are dumb. Clump people together and spook them, and what you get is a mob. And a mob is only as smart as the stupidest person in it. He looked at Edwards. Thing is, if you join us, you won't have an outside life. No wife, no kids, nothing. You cut off contact with everybody you know outside the black. In your case, it shouldn't take too long. And what you get for a prize is long hours, dangerous days, and no recognition. Edward stared at Kay. Why would anybody in his right mind go for this deal? Nobody in his right mind would, given the choice. The only satisfaction you get is doing the job, being one of a handful of people who can do the job. Kay pulled another picture from the file and handed it to Edwards. It was the kid with the flowers, definitely Kay, a whole lot younger. I didn't volunteer, see. I got drafted. You get a choice. Edwards shook his head. I don't know smart. One of the smartest things you could say. Thing is, we have aliens walking around on our planet. Only a handful of people know this, and at the moment, you are one of them. You have access to a piece of the truth that most people don't. Edward stared out into the park, and you want me to give up my identity, never get close to anyone except, no offense, you and some other dudes in black suits to pay for knowing the truth. Kay stood. He nodded. That's the deal. Doesn't seem worth it, does it? But there it is. Edwards looked at him. Kay pulled something from his pocket. Looked like a mini tape recorder. He tapped it on his palm. Tell you what, you have until tomorrow to decide. And if I decide not to, what is to keep me from blabbing all this? You wouldn't tell. You can't be sure of that. Oh, I think I can. He looked at the mini tape recorder, then put it back into his coat pocket. Be at the building tomorrow morning to let me know what you decide. Edwards walked through the streets of his neighborhood, considering his future. So here was the question. Stay where he was, doing what he knew how to do and do pretty damn well, or chuck it all to join up with some quasi-secret organization full of bad dressers to deal with aliens. What's it going to be, James? Edgar found what he thought might be a hiding place for his ship, a mostly empty structure that was home to myriad small creatures, six- and eight-legged ones. From their forms, he could recognize a certain ancestral kinship, little brothers, as it were. Edgar was behind this structure with his now-repaired vessel when he heard a Terran vehicle arrive and pull to a stop. He walked around the structure, saw Terry open a large door to the building, admitting inside a blast of bright sunshine. The Terry was dressed in some kind of uniform. An ID tag on the creature's chest read, Zappum. Edgar's translator couldn't turn the name into anything in Edgar's language. The Zappum Terry carried a metal tank. Apparently the Terry did not see him. 
but it did notice the small creatures scurrying about inside the building. Well, well, looky here, the Zappum Terry said. He set the metal tank down and unfurled a thin hose from it. He put some kind of breathing mask over his face. He turned a valve on the tank. A vapor spewed from the nozzle on the end of the tank. The Terry began to spray the substance into the building. The gas seemed to have a deleterious effect on the scuttling small ones. They began falling over. Some kind of intoxicant? Some kind of poison? What do you think you're doing? Edgar asked. The Terry started, then turned to look at Edgar. Oh, hi, I'm just taking care of your pest problem. He waved the nozzle at the small ones. Really, this was too much. He was killing the little brothers. Edgar grabbed the creature's breathing mask, ripped it off, then shoved the nozzle of the spraying device into the Terry's oral cavity. The Zappum Terry choked, gagged, then fell to the ground. It gargled a few times, twitched and spasmed, then died. During its death throes, the Terry dropped a metal ring with small, jagged metal bars upon it. Edgar queried his translator, Keys, devices for opening locks, such as houses and vehicles. Ah! He looked at the vehicle in which the Terry had arrived. It was quite large, the vehicle. The rear section of it had sufficient room so that a careful placement of Edgar's ship would not overload it. Aha! Uh -huh. Here was a solution to the awkward method of moving the ship. Why leave it here when he could take it with him? There must be something around here he could use for a ramp. Edgar walked into the structure to search for such a thing. He nodded at the bodies of the little brothers. I have avenged you, he said, and this Terry is but the beginning. Edward saw the old guard from the day before sitting in the same chair. The guard looked up, nodded. A second later, the elevator opened, and Kay stood there looking at Edwards. He raised an eyebrow. Edwards took a deep breath, blew part of it out, and nodded. I'm in, he said. Kay grinned. Edward saw him put that little tape recorder into his pocket. This way, Kay said. Edwards got in the elevator, wondering how the guard had summoned Kay. This time, the elevator began to descend when Kay touched the control. The elevator stopped and the door slid open. Edwards stared. The elevator had opened onto a large, multi-leveled atrium, manned by humans and aliens. There was a kind of platform right outside that looked out over the giant space. Man. Kay led him down a spiral ramp. They passed what looked like immigration control at the JFK airport. A human sat at the desk. A line of aliens, all kinds of aliens, stood there waiting to be processed. A large humanoid creature stood at the front of the line. The human at the desk looked at a weird little booklet the alien tendered. Passport had to be. Welcome to Earth, sir, the human said. Purpose of your trip? The alien said. Diplomatic mission. Length of stay? Lunch. Anything to declare? Are you carrying any fruits or vegetables? Kay grabbed Edwards by the arm and moved him along. So, now that I'm in, what branch of government do we report to? None, actually. Somewhere along the way, the government started asking too many questions. So we let them think we disbanded. Who pays for all this? He waved at the immense center. Well, actually, we do. We hold a few patents on gadgets we confiscated from some of our visitors trying to smuggle them in. Velcro? Microwave ovens? Liposuction, Kay grinned. Over here. He led him to a locked door. A light beam played over Kay. Then the door clicked open. Body reader, he said. Inside the room were all kinds of high-tech-looking devices stacked on tables and shelves. Kay waved one hand at them. Edwards picked up a small yellow ball. What's this? Don't touch that! The ball zipped out of his hand and shot out through the door into the hallway. Shit! Kay ran out after the ball, Edwards right on his heel. The little yellow ball zinged here and there, bounced from the walls almost faster than the eye could follow. Humans and aliens dodged it, cursed, ducked, cursed some more. Kay slipped an odd-looking metal glove onto his right hand, held it up. The ball bounced its way at them. Edwards ducked away, but Kay reached up and caught the ball in the metal gloved hand. Sorry! he yelled. He went back into the storeroom, put the ball carefully onto the shelf.
Kay led Edwards onto the main floor where a giant video screen hung on a wall like a billboard. A pair of aliens sat at a control console in front of it. They were small, bony creatures, each with eight arms and a single eye atop a central stalk. They waved at Kay, two or three arms apiece. Meet the twins, Kay said. We can't pronounce their real names, but we call them Mickey and Maud. Girls, this here's a new recruit. The twins made noises like leaky tire valves. Edwards nodded. How's it going? He looked up at the screen. Upon it was a map of the world, thousands of tiny lights flashing upon it, and log lines next to the blinking dots. On a nearby wall was a mural, the New York World's Fair. Kay pulled his attention back to the screen. This map shows the location of every registered alien on the planet. Places like New York City, you have to go to a detailed view to see all of them, but we got them. Girls, you want to bring up the rogues gallery, please? The two aliens laid hands, tentacles, whatever, on the keyboard. The map changed to hundreds of small boxes, each with a small video image. These are the aliens. In public, they all look human. In private, they relax a little. Edward stared at the screen. There was an image of a pop rock star who'd sold millions of records. Well, that wasn't any big surprise. A lot of people figured he wasn't altogether human, the way his face kept changing. But there was the guy who hosted that late-night network news TV program. There, the tall dude who did the infomercials where he guaranteed to make you rich and happy. How about that? Edwards looked up, saw Zed approaching. The older man shook his head. Follow me. Edwards did as he was told. Kay was right behind him. Zed led them down a corridor, around a couple of turnings, up a ramp, down a circular staircase, through a long hallway. After what seemed like a walkway, way too long for them to still be in one building, they arrived at a locker room. It was all in white. Walls, ceilings, floor, lockers, benches, showers, white as a stadium full of marshmallows. Zed led them inside. He opened the locker. Inside was a black suit on a hanger, a white shirt and black tie. On the shelf above it, a black hat and black sunglasses, and black shiny shoes on the bottom shelf. From now on, you'll dress in sanctioned attire, supplied to you by MIB Special Services. You issue underwear, too? K and Z both grinned. K grinned again at the big screen in the computer room. All of Edward's ID paper was up. Birth certificate, school records, driver's license, social security card, library card, police ID, everything. Behind him, Zed said to the kid, You'll conform to the identity we give you. You eat where we tell you, live where we tell you, and you get approval for any expenditure over a hundred dollars. The kid gave Zed a dark look. Kay touched a control. Behind him, Edward said, What's this? Zed said, Have a seat. Put your hands there. Kay turned, watched the kid slip his hands into the imprinter. The device was a flat black plate that looked as if somebody had pressed his hands into the plastic like it was soft clay, leaving deep impressions. Hold still. This might sting a little. There came a burst of laser light, bright enough to seep past the kid's hands. Ouch! He jerked his hands up and looked at the palms. A little residual smoke drifted from them. You now have a new set of fingerprints, Zed said. If something happens on the job and you leave prints behind where you shouldn't, they will be changed again. Come on over here, Kay said. The kid moved to look at the screen. Hey, there I am. No, nope, there you were. Kay tapped the control, the ID on the screen whirled and vanished. What replaced it? was the kid's name, James Darrell Edwards III. Kay said, you just quit the force, paid your rent, and gave up your lease. You don't exist at the DMV anymore, your credit card records went away, and your schools have no official records of you ever attending them. You can do that? Already done, Kay said. Zed said, as of this moment, you don't exist. You aren't part of the system. You are over it, above it, beyond it. We are the men in black, and you just became one of us. There is no James Darrell Edwards III anymore. Your name from now on is Jay. 
K gave the kid a proper response to such a signal. He leaned the upper section of his disguise out through the open window, extended the middle digit of his port hand upward, and yelled at the pilot to his rear, Hey, up yours, pal! Satisfied that he was communicating properly with these stupid Terrans, Edgar leaned back to the vehicle's cockpit and concentrated on his piloting. How did they manage it? If this was a daily occurrence, this crawl to get anywhere, surely most of them would have gone insane by now and begun killing each other. Destroying them would be doing them a favor. Really, it would. Jay followed Kay into Zed's office. Zed. Wonder what he'd been before. Zachariah? Zebediah? Zorro? The office was an elevated circular room with several windows high above the main floor of the MIB HQ. There were a handful of video monitors behind Zed's desk. Each of these monitors had upon it an image of a different man, dressed as all the MIB were, along with the name of a city and a clock running the local time. Zed sat with his back to the door, looking at the monitors, fiddling with some papers on his lap. He spoke to one of the monitors. Okay, B, we've got the recently deposed the prefect of Sonali scheduled to touch down in the Willamette National Forest near Portland, Oregon at 2200 tonight. I'm pulling you down from that surveillance in Anchorage for a meet and greet. The image of B nodded. We talking humanoid? Zed said, you wish. Bring a sponge. He shuffled through the papers on his lap. Came up with a sheet and looked at it. A memo outlined in red. All right, here's a red letter from last night. We had an unauthorized landing in upstate New York, farm country. He turned and looked at Kay. That's yours, Kay. Kay nodded. All right, go to work, people. The screens cleared, and as they did, there was a bleep from Zed's computer. Well, well, got us a skimmer. Kay leaned over and said to Jay, That's a resident alien traveling out of his assigned zone without permission. To Zed, Kay said, Who is it? Zed looked at the screen. Regic. Kay looked at Jay again. Hmm. See, Regic is a New Yorker, not clear to travel outside of the city. Right now, Zed said, Ah, uh, Mr. Regic is way out of town, apparently stuck in traffic on the New Jersey turnpike. Why don't you take Jay here and show him how we do things? Kay nodded. Let's go, Jay. Inside the car, Kay started the engine, put the LTD into reverse, and stomped on the gas pedal. The acceleration was unreal. Jay was thrown forward so fast he couldn't believe it. Damn, man, how many horses you got into that hood? More than enough. I hear you, Jay said. He grabbed the seat belt in a hurry. As he slid the belt into the clamp, a small lighted panel rotated up between the two men, kind of like an armrest. There was a flashing red button on the panel. Jay looked at it, put one hand tentatively toward it. Jay, you see that red button? Yeah. Never push the button. Under the wrong circumstances, that would be, how shall I say this, bad. Kay had a tracker. He was able to home in on Regic's car in the middle of nowhere, New Jersey. Now there was a redundancy. He hit the siren and flashed the police lights hidden under the grill. Regic's car pulled over. Kay looked at the kid. Stay on the passenger side of his car while I check him out. Got it. We're uh, not going to need weapons here, are we? I didn't find one in my locker. Nah, not with Regic. He's harmless. Kay got out of the Ford and walked to Regic's window. He was as innocuous-looking a human as he was an alien, looking to be in his mid-thirties, bland, vanilla wafer kind of guy. Kay smiled at him. Could I see your license and registration, please? Kay glanced past Regic and saw a pregnant woman in the passenger seat, also in her mid-thirties and aside from the bulging belly, unremarkable in appearance. That would be Mrs. Regic. The man passed him a New York driver's license and the car's registration. Kay glanced at them. The other license and registration, please. Regic passed a more colorful set of ID out of the car. These had holograms and watermarks and shimmery insets into the plastic. The resident alien cards showed Regic and his missus in their natural form, friendly-looking, tentacled, squid-like aliens with long, thin tongues dangling, smiling at the camera. He checked the address and the verification dot with his reader, then passed them back. 
Your IDs are in order, but according to our records, you are restricted to the five boroughs unless you have a visa, which I show no record of having been issued. Am I in error here? It, it's my wife. She, well, look. As if on cue, Mrs. Regic moaned and clutched at her belly. Oh, shit. How soon are we talking about here? Mrs. Regic screamed in pain. Shit. He said, all right, no problem, we'll handle it. He looked over the top of the car at Jay. You handle it. Me? Step by the car, Mr. Regic. Let you and me have a little chat while my partner helps your wife. Regic opened the door, looked at his wife nervously, whispered to Kay, Are you sure he knows what he's doing? Oh, sure, he does this all the time. No problem. Come on. Jay leaned in, said, Uh, hi, I'm, uh, Jay. The woman jerked her dress up over her knees and spread her legs, then moaned. That was all Kay needed to see. He led Regic to the rear of the car. Why are you heading out of town? Uh, I, uh, we, uh, we're supposed to meet somebody. Kay! Jay screamed. Kay glanced over that way. He couldn't see Mrs. Regic clearly, but he did see a thin tentacle shoot up from between her knees. Normal delivery so far. Kay turned back to Regic. This your first? Oh, no, we've got our first dozen. We sent them to visit their grandsire on the home world. Okay, so back to the question. Where were you going? Uh, to catch a ship. So tell me, sport, why the sudden hurry to depart our fair planet? Some of the new arrivals, Regic offered lamely. The neighborhood is getting so bad. Kay, help! Kay looked, saw Jay lying flat on his back on the side of the road, the newborn baby alien square in the middle of his chest. Oh, man, Jay said. The baby was looking right into his face. Kay slapped the alien's father on the back. Congratulations, Reggie, it's a squid. The baby cooed and gurgled at Jay, who sat up, holding it to his chest. Hey, you know, he's cute. Back in the car, Jay wiped his face with a towel. So, what's the drill here? Well, I could have written Regic a ticket for being out of his assigned area, but what kind of man would do that to a couple just had a baby? Besides, they're leaving town. Kay sighed. So the question is, what scared Regic so bad he'd risk a warp jump with a pregnant wife or a newborn baby? Jay didn't have an answer, nor did Kay really expect one. Maybe we better check the hot sheets and see if we can find something, Kay said. Jay said, what are we doing here? I thought we were going to look at the hot sheets. Kay ignored him. They were at one of the larger midtown newsstands. Kay said, follow me and learn. He walked to the paper section and picked up a copy of one of those lurid tabloids. Baby born pregnant. Top doctors baffled. Kay began to flip through it. What are you doing? Kay put the tabloid back on the rack, removed another one, put that one back, reached for another one. Kay, you're not telling me these are the hot sheets. Best damn investigative reporting there is, Kay said. You're pulling my chain, aren't you? You know what we do for a living. When was the last time you read about aliens in the New York Times? He shook his head. Those guys don't have a clue. Now these guys, he waved the tabloid, these guys are at least on the right track. You are actually looking for tips in supermarket tabloids. Not looking, Slick. Found. Kay held up the paper for Jay to see the story on the inside. Farm wife says alien stole my husband's skin. Spaceship crushes family truck. Husband vanishes. Come on, Kay said. We're going to take a little ride in the country. Edgar sat in the cockpit of the Zappum vehicle. He looked at himself in the small reflective device that allowed him to see to the rear of the vehicle, noticed a small flap of skin dangling from his neck. The skin tag was turning grayish and getting a bit crusty. He reached up and peeled it off. This costume wasn't going to last much longer without another spit coat, but maybe it wouldn't have to. Even as he thought this, he saw the door open. What was it named again? Ah, the jewelry store, he recalled and the one known as Rosenberg emerged. Rosenberg was an older model, and he carried two items. One appeared to be an intricately carved box. The other was a small, furry animal Edgar identified as a cat. It was sometimes the custom on this world for the higher mammals to keep lower orders as pets. 
Rosenberg set the cat upon the box, then attended to the locking mechanisms on the door to the jewelry store. There appeared to be five such devices. When he finished, he picked up the cat and box and walked away. Edgar started the vehicle and allowed it to idle along slowly, following the walker. He had to see where Rosenberg was going. Why don't you let me drive? Jay asked Kay. I don't think you're quite ready for this car yet. Are we almost there yet? Almost there was somewhere in upstate New York. The last hour or so had been in country so rural Jay couldn't believe it. Cows, horses, big empty fields, woods. The road wound through the trees, getting narrower and ruddier. By the time they actually got to their destination, they might as well have been in the middle of outer Mongolia. There was one house, not much bigger than a double-wide trailer, and what appeared to be the smashed, shattered, burned-out remains of a pickup, upon which a large and heavy weight seemed to have fallen, sinking through the truck a few feet right into the gravel driveway. Whatever had done the damage was not apparent. Looks like his truck overheated, Jay said. Kay pulled the LTD to a stop. After about a minute, a woman appeared in the doorway of the little house. Calling her plain would be a kindness. Can I help you, gentlemen? She called out. They got out of the car and started up the driveway. As they walked, Kay pulled a card from his wallet. Jay glanced at the card, which looked like a blank black credit card. As Jay watched, the card morphed into a leather badge holder with a very official-looking FBI ID card and badge in it. Kay waved the badge at the woman, then tucked it away. How do you do, ma'am? I'm Special Agent Mannheim. This is Special Agent Black. We're with the FBI. We have a few questions. So you're here to make fun of me, too? No, ma'am. We at the FBI don't have a sense of humor that we are aware of. May we come in? The woman led them to the house, into a tiny kitchen. So tell us about your husband, Mrs... Uh... Yax. Beatrice Yax. Come on into the living room. They followed her. Beatrice Yax told her story. So the sheriff said, Well, Miss Yax, if Edgar was dead, how was he able to walk back into the house? Well, Beatrice said, I was stumped by that myself, but I know Edgar, and even though it looked just like him, it wasn't him, if you know what I mean. Did this person say anything, Ms. Yax? He said the truck got blowed up by sugar, but then he said he wanted some sugar in water. Kay nodded. Sugar water? I see. So are you going to track this alien down and punish him for what he did to the truck and Edgar? Oh, yes, ma'am. You can rest assured of that. He pulled that little tape recorder thing Jay had seen him play with a couple of times, pointed it at the woman. Look here a second, would you, Ms. Yax? The woman looked. There came a flash of light, and the woman's face went blank. Kay turned to Mrs. Yax. Now, Beatrice, listen carefully. There was no alien. Thing is, Beatrice, Edgar ran off with an old girlfriend. And after you go and stay with your mother for a few days, you'll decide you're a lot better off without him. One final thing, Beatrice. We were never here. So naturally, you wouldn't know us if you ever saw us again, and you won't remember any of this conversation. Outside, Kay walked to the remains of the pickup truck and looked at it. How did the sucker get mashed like this? Alien ship must have landed on it, just like it said in the paper. Edgar came out to see what the fuss was about. The alien whacked him, took his skin. That happen a lot? No. Nope. Mostly the legit visitors buy their disguises off-world. So the fact that our visitor killed a local and swiped his skin for his mask, well, that's bad. That's pretty much a felony everywhere. So we're dealing with a criminal. He pulled another gadget from his pocket and pointed it at the crunched and fried truck. A thin beam flashed out and danced over the wreck and down into the depression. Now what? Spectral analyzer. Picks up stray molecules a life form leaves behind. Kind of like an electronic bloodhound. See this little screen? It's color-coded to tell us what kind of alien we're dealing with. He waved the device. The little screen flashed, emitted a pulsing red light, flashed again, yellow this time. The next time it flashed blue. Kay was talking to the device. Stop it, purple, he said. Don't go to green, okay? The device shifted to purple, seemed to hold there. Thank you, Kay said. But the toy pulsed for a couple of seconds, then the light changed to green, stayed green. 
Well, shit, Kay said. Do you know what this means? Kay headed for the car. You're just going to leave me hanging? Jay said, following him. What? At the car, Kay pulled what looked like an old-fashioned CB mic from under the dash and keyed it. Zed, this is Kay. I'm here, came back from the radio. We're at the Red Letter landing site upstate. He paused, took a deep breath. We got a bug, Zed. So there they were, upstate New York, looking at the remains of some Yahoo's pickup truck, and the damned reader had flashed green. Big trouble. The kid, in that smart-ass way he had, said, I'm going to jump past you here and guess that a bug is a bad thing, is that right? Kay stared at him. Listen up, tiger. Bugs thrive on carnage. They consume, infest, infect, ruin, and destroy. They live off death and decay. And they are not above causing it so they can benefit. Is this a racial problem you have with all insect-based life forms? Let me put it to you this way. Imagine, if you would, a T-Rex-sized cockroach. This bug is smarter than you are, four times stronger than a full-grown ox, nine times meaner than hell, and it hates us. Now picture it walking around Manhattan in its brand-new Edgar suit. Does this sound like a fun dance partner? So, all right, we got a bad dude. What do we do? How do we find it? Get in the car. We have to get back to the city. You'll go to the city. He's here to assassinate somebody. That's what bugs do. It's a big town. How are we going to find him? We walk.